Countdown to Halloween 2022, featuring eerie and uncanny tales of haunts, ghosts, and suspense. Every Monday at exactly midnight, a new story will appear on StoryLink Radio's YouTube channel as we count down to Halloween 2022. You will have seven days to listen, then the next one will appear. Each story will be 13 to 30 minutes long. And now, tonight's story from StoryLink Radio. <laughs> Playful spooks have interrupted our countdown. Please remain seated for the following special announcement. Tonight's story will proceed in just a moment. Good evening, intrepid Halloween countdowners. We're edging ever closer to October 31st. Well, a few months to go yet, but we are intrepid countdowners after all. Beginning next week, we will be shifting to a monthly rather than a weekly countdown. We have just too many exciting and time-consuming new projects going on at StoryLink Radio. Check out our website. So the first Monday of every month, we will release a new eerie and uncanny tale of haunts, ghosts, and suspense. Beginning next week, Monday, March 7th, with a very special two-hour production of Darby O'Gill and the Banshees Halloween to celebrate the month of the Irish. We will also be tossing in a few bonus stories and other special live events from time to time, so be sure, be sure to subscribe and click that alert bell to get notifications of new releases. Click like, and please do leave comments. We read every one. And, ah, well, you know the drill. <laughs> oh, yes, and get everybody you know to subscribe, too. All of this year's countdown stories are still available to listen to, so if you missed any, just hit the back button and listen now. And in cooperation with the author Gregory Miller, we are proud to offer the entire... Countdown to Halloween 2021, right here on the StoryLink Radio YouTube channel for you to watch and listen to right now on demand. So if you missed any of those, now is your chance to binge and catch up. And of course, our podcast is always available, and we will be publishing new stories there too. Just search your favorite podcast provider for StoryLink Radio. If you're not sure how to do that, just go to our website and click on the podcast button. Our website, of course, is www.storylinkradio.com. Thank you all for staying with us as we count down to Halloween 2022. Happy Halloween, everybody! And now, back to tonight's story. Tonight's story is The White Wyrack by Stefan Grabinski, translated into English by Miroslaw Lipinski. Stefan Grabinski was a Polish writer of horror fiction whom some have called the Polish Poe or the Polish Lovecraft and suggested that he believed in the supernatural forces in his stories. I was a young journeyman at the time, like you, my dear boys, and I worked like a house on fire. <laughs> Master Kalina, may the Lord shine on his worthy soul, frequently said I would be first in attaining mastership after following him. And he spoke of me as the, the pride of our profession. Now, I don't want to brag, but I had strong legs, and I could dig my elbows into a chimney like no one else. In the third year of my service, I received the assistance of two apprentices, and I became an instructor to my younger comrades. In all, there were seven of us. We got along splendidly with one another. Even on holidays and Sundays, our brotherhood would gather at the master's house for a chat by a beer, or when it was winter, by a warm tea near the chimney, and can we talk to, uh, talk to our fill. So the evenings we spent together passed nicely, like, like a brush lowered into the mouth of a furnace. Eh? Now, Master Kalina, huh, what can I say about him? The man was literate and intelligent. He had seen a lot of the world. As the saying goes, he, he cleaned out not just one chimney. He was a bit of a philosopher, too, and, he, and the books he really liked. He, he apparently even wanted to put out a gazette for chimney sweepers. But in matters of faith, he didn't play the philosopher. 
On the contrary, he, he had a particular devotion to St. Florian, our, our patron. I felt closest to the master, and after him to the young journeyman, Joseph Biedro, a boy as pure as gold, whom I liked for his good heart and gentle soul. Unfortunately, I, I would not enjoy that friendship for very long. After Biedron, I most liked Anterek, a melancholic lad who usually kept to himself. He, he was a born worker, however, conscientious and strangely relentless in his job. Kalina valued him a lot and tried to get him to socialize with people, but without much success. Nevertheless, Anterak gladly spent his evenings at the master's house, listening with interest from his dark corner to the master's stories, which he completely believed in. Uh, no one could tell a story like our old man. He drew them out as if from a, a bag, one more interesting than the other, and when he finished one, he'd start a new one, then throw in a third one, and so on, and in each story one could detect some deeper thought hidden behind all those words. But one was still young and foolish then, and, and took from these stories only what amused one for a laugh. Only Antarok looked at the master's tales in a different light and managed to get to their core. <laughs> the rest of us, however, called Master Kalina's stories balderdash. Oh, they were engrossing, sometimes horrible, until one's flesh crept and one's hair stood on end. But despite it all, only tales and balderdash. Yet, yet, life soon soon taught us a little bit differently. One day in the middle of summer, a comrade of ours was absent at our evening get-together. Antarag was not present at his usual dark corner behind the cupboard. He, he, he must have gotten sidetracked with some girls. <laughs> Joked Biedron, though he knew that his friend was Ill, Ill at ease with women and avoided their company. Stop talking nonsense, Kalina said. He's probably very depressed and is sitting at home like a bear in the backwoods. The evening passed sadly and, and slowly, and as it was without the presence of our most fervent listener. There was no joking around, though, the following morning, for Antarak did not show up for work at ten o'clock. The master thought he was sick and went to his home. He found only his mother there, an old woman much distressed by her son's absence. She reported that her son had left for the city at dawn of the previous day and had not yet returned. Master Kalina decided to undertake the search himself. Antarag is a gloomy fellow, is he? God knows what he's done. Maybe he's hiding out somewhere. But he searched in vain. Finally, remembering that Antarak had to clean out a chimney in an old brewery beyond the city, he directed his investigations there. At the brewery, he was told that, um, indeed, yesterday morning, a journeyman had reported to them to clean the chimney. Well, at what time did he... Finish the job, then, asked Master Kalina of some old man, grey like a pigeon, whom he met at the threshold of one of the brewery's annexes. I don't know, Master. He left so imperceptibly, even he didn't know when. He must have been in a great hurry, though, because he didn't even look to us for payment. Mm, muttered Master Kalina, lost in thought. There's a strange bird, that fellow. But did he clean up the chimney well? How is it working now? Is it drawing properly? No, no, not too well at all. In fact, this morning my daughter-in-law complained once again that it's, it's smoking terribly. If it doesn't get better by tomorrow, we'll be asking for another cleaning. We will. Aye, hey, it will be done, the master quickly retorted, angry that they were not satisfied with his worker and very worried about the lack of more specific information concerning him. That evening we gathered together in sorrow at our supper and parted early. The following day the same thing. Neither sight nor sound of Antarach. He had disappeared like a stone in water. In the early afternoon the brewery sent a boy with a request to clean the chimney because it was a smoking for all it's worth, they said. Biedron went around four and but did not return. I wasn't there when Master Kalina sent him out, so I knew nothing about it, but I got a bad feeling when, later that evening, I, I saw the downcast faces of the master and the other sweeps. So, where's Josic? I asked, looking for him about the room. He has not returned from the brewery, <sighs> answered Kalina gloomily. I jumped up from my seat. 
but the master forcibly stopped me. No, I won't let you go alone. They've had enough of this. Tomorrow morning both of us will go. An evil spirit, not a brewery. I'll clean out their chimney for them. That night I did not sleep a wink. At daybreak I put on my climbing gear and throwing over my shoulder my brushes with their attachments I and went out, and in a short while I presented myself at the master's door. Kalina was already waiting for me. Here, take this, he said, handing me a hatchet that appeared to be newly wetted. This could be of more use to you than a broom or a scraper, hmm? Okay. Without a word, I took the hatchet in hand, and we started at a quick pace toward the brewery. The August morning was beautiful, tranquil. The city slept. In silence, we passed through the marketplace, went over the bridge and turned left and along the river embankment and onto a road that wound its way through poplar trees. It was a long walk to the brewery. After a strenuous pace of fifteen minutes, we got off the road and took a shortcut through a hayfield. In the distance, beyond an alder forest, the coppery slices of the brewery roofs were visible. Kalina removed the cap from his head, crossed himself, and began silently to move his lips. I walked next to him, not interrupting his prayers. After a while, the master covered his head again and gripped his hatchet tighter and started talking in a soft voice. An evil spirit, not a brewery. There's beer there, and for at least ten years it has not been brewed, and an old ruin and nothing more. The last brewer, someone named Rosband, went bankrupt and hanged himself out of despair. His family sold the buildings and the entire inventory, dirt cheap to the city, and they, they moved away somewhere. No one's lived there since. The boilers and machines are supposed to be evil. They, they have an old system. No one wants to take the financial risk of replacing it with a new one here. Yeah. Why then, um, Master, who exactly wanted the chimney cleaned? I asked, glad that the conversation had interrupted the morose silence. Eh, some gardener who, a month ago, for practically nothing, moved into the empty brewery with his wife and his father. They have many rooms and enough space for several families. For sure, they moved into the center rooms, which are the best in the state, and they are living there for little money. Now their chimneys are smoking because they are old and heavily packed with soot. They have not been cleaned for ages. And he added with a thoughtful pause, I don't like these old chimneys. But why, Master? Because there's more work with them? Ah, don't be silly, my dear boy. I'm afraid of them, do you understand? I'm afraid of old flues that haven't been touched for years by a brush or scraper. It's better to demolish such chimneys and put up new ones than to have someone clean it. I glanced at Kalina's face at that moment. It was strangely altered by fear and aversion. What is the, ma the matter, Master Kalina? And he, as if he had not heard me, continued on staring somewhere ahead. Soot is dangerous, particularly when it accumulates in narrow dark spaces unreachable by the rays of the sun. And not just because it can easily catch fire. No, no, not just because of that. Con consider this. We chimney sweeps and battle our entire lives with soot. We prevent its excessive accumulation and so prevent an explosion. Yeah. But soot. Yeah. Soot is treacherous, my boy. Soot lays dormant inside dark smoke chambers and stuffy furnaces, and it lies in wait. Ay, it lies in wait for an opportunity. Something vindictive resides in soot. Something evil lurks there. You never know what it will emerge from it, or when. <sighs> he became silent and glanced at me. Even though I did not understand what he had said, his words, uttered with strong conviction, had, had their effect on me. But then he smiled his good, kind-hearted smile and added soothingly, Bah, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe something completely different's happened there. <laughs> Cheer up. We'll find out everything in a moment. If, uh, uh, we've arrived at our destination, yeah. Indeed, we had reached the brewery. Through the open entrance gate, I followed the master to the wide courtyard from which a multitude of doors led to various buildings at the brewery. At the threshold of one door sat the gardener's wife, a child at her breast, while beyond her, leaning against the door sill, stood her husband. Seeing us, the man became confused with visible uneasiness and came out to greet us. 
Have you, 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 you've come to see us about the chimney, eh? 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 Mm, of course, eh, you, the master answered coldly. But not because of the chimney, but because of the two people I sent to clean it. The gardener's unease increased. His eyes shifted continually. My men haven't returned yet from this brewery, cried out Kalina passionately, glaring at him. What happened to them? You're responsible for them. What, sir? The gardener rumbled. I, I really don't know what happened to them. We, we thought that first one had already turned up. As for the second one, I, I just don't know. Yesterday afternoon, in my, in my presence, he entered the chimney through the door in the kitchen wall. Uh, for some time, I clearly heard him scraping the, the soot away. I, I would have remained at the end of the operation if I hadn't been called out to the courtyard. Uh, afterward, I left my home for a couple of hours, and when I returned, uh, nothing was said about the chimney or your man. I thought that he had done his job, returned to the city, eh? So we closed the ventilation door for the night. Uh, only now. When I saw the both of you enter in our courtyard, did I become a bit troubled? Eh? It suddenly occurred to me that something terrible has been happening here for the last two days. I see that I'm right. Eh? What, but what's going on? What, what is it, Master Kalina? What can be done? <laughs> he spread out his hands in a sign of innocence. I'm not to blame. Well, at least you shouldn't have closed the door to the chimney, you fool. Kalina cried out angrily. After me, Peter. He shouted, pulling me by the arm. We don't have a second to lose. And to the gardener, take us to the chimney, now, man. The terrified gardener led us inside. We soon found ourselves in the kitchen. Here, here, in the corner, said the gardener, pointing to the rectangular chimney door. Kalina took a step toward it, but anticipating him, I moved quickly and opened the small door. A smell of smoke blew over us, and a little soot fell to the floor. Before the master could interfere, I was already kneeling at the inlet, my arms stretched upward in preparation for a climb. Are you crazy? Kalina's angry voice responded. Let me go up. This is my affair. You set up the ladder to the roof and you get up on top to guard the outlet. Yeah. For the first time in my life, I did not listen to the master. <laughs> a mad stubbornness and a desire to uncover the truth possessed me completely. Why don't you go up to the roof yourself, master? I responded. I promise to wait here until you give me the signal. Kalina uttered an ugly curse, and whether he liked it or not, he had to surrender to my command. Soon I heard his distancing steps, and then I tied a silk mask tightly over my mouth and nose, and I adjusted the straps of my belt, and, and I gripped the hatchet. Now, before you could say two Hail Marys, I heard the knocking of the ball that had been lowered down the chimney. Kalina was already on the roof and was giving me the agreed-upon signal. So I crawled on all fours in the throat of the chimney, and groping about, I found the ball. I pulled on it three times, and a sign that I had received the signal was commencing my journey upwards. After passing the turn in the chimney, I straightened up, instinctively protecting my head with the hatchet. Now this chimney was wide, navigable with ridges, and thickly packed with soot. Here at the bottom, right beside the door, layers of easily flammable um, enamel, glowed with a cold metallic luster in the faint light coming from the top of the chimney. I threw a glance upward, and I shuddered. Above me, several feet beyond the blade of my hatchet, I, I saw in the half-light of the flue a snow-white being staring at me with a pair of huge, owlish yellow eyes. The creature, part monkey, part large frog, was holding in its front claws what seemed like a human arm, which hung limply from a corpse, vaguely outlined in a twisted shape next to the neighboring wall. Drenched in a cold sweat, I propped myself against the sides of the chimney with my legs, and I raised myself up slightly. And then from that creature's long mouth came a savage, predatory sound. <coughs> and it ground its teeth menacingly. My movement seemed to have alarmed it and apparently changed position. But at that moment, a wider shaft of light rushed into the depths of the chimney and lit up the horrible picture all that more clearly. Attached as through some miracle, as if stuck to the wall with the bottom of his toes, the, the creature held Beatrung tightly with his arms. 
his rear limbs covered with white downy fur wrapped in a crosswise grip the legs of the victim, while the greedy proboscis of his elongated snout now adhered to the temple of the unfortunate man. A rage enveloped me, and overcoming my fear, I climbed up a couple more feet. The white creature, apparently upset, turned to me again and started to prick his spoon-like ears and grind his teeth ever more loudly, but he did not move from his place. <laughs> I saw his vain endeavors as he wanted to spring down on me or escape up the chimney, but his movements were unusually awkward and ponderous. It seemed that he had grown torpid, as a snake does after swallowing a victim, or, or that he had become drunk on an overabundance of sucked blood. Only his bulging eyes, round like plates, buried themselves into me with increasing severity, and he threatened me with his look and sound. But my anger predominated over my terror. I drew back the hatchet swiftly, and with all my might I let it go in that horrible white skull. The blow was strong and accurate. In one moment the light in his large eyes died out. Something brushed by me. I heard a dull groan below. The strange being had fallen to the bottom of the chimney, pulling down his victim in the process. A shudder of disgust shook me to the core. I didn't have courage to go down and check the result of my blow. The only thing left for me to do was to go up to the roof. Besides, I was already at the halfway point of the chimney from whose outlet I heard Kalina's voice. I began a quick climb to the top, using all my strength to dig into the sides of the chimney with elbows and legs, but who can relate my horror when a couple of feet higher I saw, hanging on a hook, sticking out of the wall of the chimney, the carcass of Antarak. Oh, the body of the poor man was in a terrible state, incredibly gaunt and shriveled up to a sliver, almost skin and bones. It seemed half cured by exposure to smoke, and stretched out like a string, dry and hard like a piece of wood. With trembling hands, I unhooked the carcass, winding its middle a few times with the rope from the ball. I pulled twice in the cord as a signal to Kalina. A couple of minutes later, I, I found myself on the roof where the master was waiting for me with Antarak's body by his side. He greeted me sullenly, with knitted brows. Where's Bidron? he asked tersely. In a few words, I told him everything. After we had carefully lowered Antarak to the ground along the ladder, he said calmly, Yes, the white Wyrak, that was him. I had a feeling it would be him. Hmm, the white Wyrak. In silence, we went through the hall and two rooms and returned to the kitchen. There wasn't a living soul here. The gardener and his family had slunk away to some wing of the building. Placing Antarak's body by the wall, we advanced to the opening of the chimney. Sticking out of it were a pair of stiff, naked legs. We pulled out Biedron. We laid him on the floor by his comrade. You see those two small wounds they have on their temples? Asked Kalina in a subdued voice. That is his sign. He cuts into his victims there and consumes them. And repeated a couple of times. The white Wyrak. The white Wyrak. Ma. Well, I have to finish him off, I replied stubbornly. Maybe he is not dead yet. Eh, I doubt it. Apparently he can't stand the light. Eh, let's take a look, though, eh? And we gazed into the depths of the opening. Deep inside, we vaguely saw something white. Kalina glanced about the kitchen and spotted a long pole with an iron hook at its end. We picked up the pole and shoved it into the chimney opening. Then he started to draw it out. Slowly, a white mass began to emerge from the darkness. A sort of snowy, downy fleece that came closer and closer to the ventilator. But along the way, the Wyrax's corpse seemed to, seemed to melt and contract. When Kalina finally drew out the entire pole, there, there hung from its iron tip only a, a small milk-white substance was flaky and disarranged, and resembled a soft hide or a bit of fluff. And then suddenly this substance slid off the hook and fell to the ground, and then a strange change occurred to it. In the mere twinkling of an eye, the white material turned a coal-like color, and at our feet lay a large mass of soot, 
glittering and black like tar. Yes, that's all the remains of him, whispered Kalina, plunged in thought. And after a moment he added as if to himself, From soot you came, to soot you shall return. And placing our unfortunate comrades on a stretcher, we carried off their bodies to the city. Shortly after that, Master Kalina and I both got a peculiar outbreak on our skins. Over our entire bodies appeared large white pimples, resembling pearly grits. After several weeks, these pimples disappeared as quickly, as unexpectedly as they had arrived, leaving not a trace of their repulsive presence. You've just heard tonight's story from StoryLink Radio's Countdown to Halloween 2022. Remember to come back for our next tale. Many more stories of all genres available to listen to and read along with now on our website at www.storylinkradio.com. Visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash storylinkradio. And visit our podcast for easy mobile listening anywhere, anytime. Just search for StoryLink Radio on your favorite podcast provider. Oh, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click that alert bell for StoryLink Radio. Radio.